Yeah, we farm at Tangaroria um, on the Northern Wai River, which is about, uh, we're about 20 minutes from Dargaval driving and about 40 minutes from Whangarei. So, you know, kind of you draw a straight line between Whangarei and Dargaval, but that's about where we are. Uh, the farm itself is 446 hectares, um, just typical northern broken rolling hill country, I guess. A little bit of flat, not a lot, but a little bit. And we farm about 1,300 ewes plus replacements, we winter 1,300 ewes plus replacements, and about 600 cattle. I grew up on the farm just up the road here and um, married my husband sitting beside me um, and then was a nurse prior to that time I was working at North Shore Hospital. Came back, worked at the local hospital here for a couple of years and then we had three children, Ryan, Sean and Brianna. Um, yeah, so in that time I was working sort of casually on the ward, um, bringing up the children and then uh, yeah, when Brianna went back to school, um, I went back more permanently and I'm now working at the um, Dagua Medical Centre, so that's quite handy because I'm only two days a week on the odd casual third day. Um, but that's good, it's just a bit of a break between the farm life and work life. And I guess the demo farm, I got, I got to the base of the end of my tether really, I thought we have to do something. You know, I'm sick of going through winter and ploughing soils up and watching it wa wash away. And we have to do something. We just—it's it's too many years. We were getting into the, you know, we we're just killing our spring production by butchering our soils over the winter time. And um, so I guess you know it became an opportunity to say, well, okay, can we, can we try a herd home type situation, or a barn, or a standoff pad, or, or something to, um, to, to help us through that that wetter that wetter part of winter. And um, that's how it was born, really. And, came to our decision to build a barn. Uh, that was the easy part really, the most difficult part was actually to, to, to build it at a reasonable cost. And um, it wasn't until um, Glenn Taylor from Geico Construction came on board that we, we actually came to something that was even within remotely feasible as far as the cost side of the, was concerned. And even then it was still about $1,000 an animal. So it's not insignificant. So we thought if we could house 200 cattle off of our biggest cattle off the farm in the winter time, we would really negate our pugging and um, and make a big difference. But there were too many um, there were too many things we didn't know. So really, we decided to go halfway. So at the moment, theoretically, the barn will hold 110, mm. and we decided, well, you know, if what we learn out of building the first one, if it is phenomenally successful, we can always build another one. You know, so we went halfway, and that's where we're at at the moment. Where, where it really starts making money is uh, um, when the soils are wet enough that you can't go back onto them for the second round of your, your rotation, if you know what I mean. Um, that's when it becomes, your gains become exponential because you're not making a, a bigger mess over one area of ground. You're having to, you're having to shift your cattle onto a, another area outside the original rotation. And that's where your, your soil damage and your pasture loss just grows exponentially. So, what exactly the rainfall and what exactly the the, the numbers are, it, it changes every year and it'll change for every different farm. But that for us, you know, a five percent um, increase in pasture production is a break-even figure for the for the barn as it stands at the moment. Yeah, we don't really know enough. I mean, we've had. Um, you know, two droughts through the middle of it and a storm that blew the roof off or part of the roof off in the second winter so it's been very hard to put real concrete numbers on it. That's probably been the most frustrating part of the thing about it, that we put, you know, everybody put a lot of work into it and, um, but there's some rough things we know, do know. We know that, you know, on this farm on an average winter we lose about 9% of total pasture production for the year through pasture damage. But the demo farm thing really, I think, is the biggest thing we learned out of it is actually um, building a team around it when you want to do anything or want to, you know, it's brought us. Totally. It's, um, it's brought us into Farmax. We're using Farmax now, yeah. you know, and we've got a farm consultant on board. You know, we're a lot more involved with our vets now in terms of doing mm -hmm. different things. It's we as we as sheep and beef farmers, I think, countrywide, you know, it's in our upbringing or our makeup that we are individualistic, you know, and it's and that's a great thing in a lot of ways because we help we can handle the, you know, the, the 
things that are thrown at us, but in a, in a lot of other ways, it, it, it's our weakness as well because we don't reach out and 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 grab hold of those people that can help us often enough. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the greatest things that we as sheep and beef farmers in the country, if we're going to survive and if we're going to prosper, we have to be better at doing. It. Initially, when we started, uh, you know, the career as farmers together. Um, Grant Stead was a huge, huge part of that, and of course, there's still the traditionalist way of, of farming. Um, so, for Grant to start, you know, coming up with his own plans and his own, um, you know, ways that he wanted to, things that he wanted to do, the demonstration farm really just came along at the right time. He was just getting lost. He didn't know what to do. He just needed some, I don't know, some enthusiastic. And the team, the demonstration farm, just came in at the right time, and then there were a neat group of people behind it, um, and there was just so much positivity. It was great, and. Uh, he just relaxed, it was he had support, he wasn't on his own um, and then as soon as we sort of got things um, rolling and the shed up and away and financially saw that it was going to be okay, um, yeah he relaxed and slept a lot better, a lot less snoring at night, the rain on the roof, the rain on the roof now he lies there in the morning and oh well you know don't worry about it because we know that the cattle are in the, in the barn and they're dry and they're, they're dry underfoot so just relax and so many times he comes home, shuts the door and goes oh God, I love that barn. God, I love that barn. And it's neat to hear that. You don't hear that enough from a farmer as a wife, I don't think. There will, there'll be changes. We'll be more, there'll be more intensive in parts of the farm. The farm will be intensified. Um, but there'll also be more areas um, taken out for environmental protection as well. So it's funny, it's, it's almost like an oxymoron, but it's um, a contradiction in terms. But the more we can intensify some areas of the farm, the more we'll be able, actually be able to retire, and the, the, the more the more marginal areas. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that the sheep side of the operation, I think, will just continue um, simplifying, simplifying, and getting more out of less. You know, we'll, I think we can. You know, certainly, I think we've, we're going to try and. You know, still have you know, the same. We, about 2,000 lambs is about what we can handle, and so if we can get that out of 1,100 ewes and 370 hoggets, that's fine. The big change at the moment is, is actually doing more. You know, the systems or intensive V systems have always been a part of the farm, but they've always been very temporary in nature, as in put, in the, put up the start of the winter and then pulled down when there's, the water situation becomes becomes a, an issue. But you know we've started last year and continuing this year to build more permanent ones, so we can control our control our um, rotation lengths and grazing pressure and feed intakes of our cattle, our finishing cattle, you know, 12 months of the year. As much country as we can do that to on this place, we'll, mm. we'll continue doing that. But it's not it's broken country and it's it's not cheap and it's not easy to do those sorts of things. So you've got to just quietly work your way through them do that sort of. For the barn, for a start, it was growing maize to grow cattle in the barn. The last two years we've just used grass silage because we've had we've had enough, to, you know, made enough to do that. Mm. Um, you possibly will, we will go back to maize again in the future, um, but that that'll be on a season by season basis. I think we'll just, mm. yeah. you know, we had we had such a good season last year and we carried we had a lot of. You know, quite a lot of silage left over, grass silage left over, so we didn't have to make as much this spring. So, um, certainly for the sheep side of things, um, part of part of what happened after we've, after the demo farm program is we've got involved with our vets and Todd Scudder at, at um, Dagwell Vets has been really proactive with us and it's been good. We did a fecal egg count reduction test on our sheep last year and that was interesting, eye opening. So I said to him, I said, ignorance is bliss, but knowledge is power. I guess. Um, so in, in terms of, that's in terms of raising the producti productivity of the ewe flock, we'll use um, summer crops, chicory, plantain for our ewe hoggets. You know, I think it, all go, well, it all starts back at lambing. You know, we, we have, I think we have 30, 31 and a half kilo weaning weight this year. You know, we'll probably have to improve that a bit. And um, certainly the, the lambs on the chicory this year already so far have done you know, a good 250 grams plus a day, so if we can you know, we simply have to work backwards and see just what our weaning weight needs to be and what I know probably will drop off, that'll drop off as the autumn goes on, but I guess it's the target and I think I really really think for us here on this in our environment I think we need to aim for fifty kilo hoggets to go to the other end. 
I don't think it's impossible either. So, so that's that's how cropping. I think cropping going to play a part in that. Mm-hmm. New grass is is a cropping leading to new grass. I guess um, I'm not convinced that it's in our environment. New pasture species are that fantastic. Um, and saying that, you know, the kaikuya paddocks we have done, have, have certainly, even though they've reverted a lot to kaikuya, the, the new ryegrasses are still there, so we get a lot better winter production out of them. But I'm, I'm not convinced that it's, you know, we should be going out doing 20% of the farm a year at all. Yeah, the, the systems and the, the changes in, in how we operate brought about because of our involvement in the beef and lamb demo farmers. Um, probably, probably the best illustration of it is. Christine had quite a bad car accident last year, and um, because we were using Farmax, because you know we were we were proactive in our decision making. A lot of the decisions that needed to be made over the next few months had already been made. Um, that's you know the Farmax gives you that you know, ability to look into the future and, and to you know your, your mind's you know my mind was, last year certainly wasn't on the farm. But it was very easy to look at farm. It's okay. We booked the nitrogen for this. The aircraft's there. The, you know, things things were happening, and that that's a that's a powerful thing. That's a real powerful thing to be you know, to be able to. And it's certainly one of my abiding feelings about being involved in the beef and lamb demo farm project, and, or you know, that that has given that that gave us at that time when we most needed. It gave us the ability to keep, just the business just carried on, mm. even though neither of us were 100 percent in it. So. We've had so. some great friendships too, you know, with couples down the country that weekend that we always get together. Yep. That's just really, um, yeah, it's quite a wait now, isn't it? It's lovely we get together and we all see what we're doing and how we're progressing or not or, yeah. yeah. That's been good and you, you know, you pick up on ideas from other people as well throughout the country in the, in the, in the program and, and you yeah, know, just see their challenges as well because it doesn't matter where you are, everyone's got a, everyone's got a certain challenge and for us it's mud and rain and, Eczema and the rest of it, but you know, everyone else has got their own. Yeah, we are one permanent labour unit, but we've got. Um, I bring in a retired, retired dog man, Alan Nesbitt comes in and um, he's, he's one day a week at the moment. He comes in and helps him, but you know, if any big stock jobs, he gets stuck into that. And then docking time and docking time, and then we get we do get casual labour when we need it. Um, you know, fencing and stuff. It's, which works well. Which works well. Yeah, and that'll probably continue. That. Mm. That's a, that's that's going to be probably the beauty of a lot of these intensive permanent intensive bee systems. They're going to be very simple mm. to operate, and um, you know we can get people. It's very simple to explain to someone to how to run them. You know if everything's set up and the little markers there, you put the fence up there or whatever. You shift them every two days, or it becomes very um, systemised and, and it's very easy to train someone to to run those systems. So I think as we get older, as we want, as the kids grow up and do their own things that we might be camper van following them around the country. <laughs> this <can't> on video. <laughs> camper van. <laughs> but that that's that's the kind of you know.